Hi, my name is Will Gringer and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, uh, this is a live stream and I would very much appreciate it if anyone can tell me if they can hear my voice. And uh, I hopefully it's a lot cooler today and I've reconfigured the camera's setup so it may not uh, shut down. I've got a different capture card on it. And uh, the downside is um, my reconfiguration moved the microphone away from a direct connection and my other microphone doesn't work. So I'm actually using the onboard microphone on the camera that I'm looking at, at you. So the downside with that is if it does go off, we're going to lose my audio as well. Anyway, uh, uh, this is going to be slightly less of a real time workout, what I want to say, uh, than last night. But there will be quite a bit of that going on and hopefully um, when I get back from Italy um, things will be a little bit more ordered and uh, 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 reliable because uh, I, I won't be uh, needing to do my fatherly duties, uh, holiday time fatherly duties and so um, I'm hoping that will be okay. So sound is good, sorry it's probably a little bit uh, um, echoey. Uh, okay so um, I'm going to start um, with our cover slide here and hopefully the computer I'm working on doesn't also have issues uh, like it did last time. So the cover slide is this, it is technological production of ball lightning versus natural formation. Now um, I'm not going to uh, do a large number of examples here. Um, John has been fantastic today, he sent me a whole series of videos, uh, one where at the end of one clip from a particular TV show you can actually see the end of uh, his ball lightning accelerator and uh, he's given me some other detail and you can see that uh, on the remote view uh, uh, .icu recent uh, blog posts. Uh, you can see some other videos of other authors. Uh, what I will do today is I'm going to be focusing on one uh, video that was sent to me some time ago by David Boutlier, who is a colleague working and collaborating with the MFMP on the Vega experiments. And it's a piece of historical work of his, but um, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, uh, following yesterday's presentation, uh, which was uh, this one, uh, and uh, uh, John Hutchison sent a comment in the YouTube stream and uh, this led me to believe that now was probably the right time to be just, uh, trying to work through uh, David's uh, um, production of uh, or seeming production of ball lightning and um, we this is the comment he made so uh, he said, um, brilliant Bob, uh, ball beads I've seen are very bright, but it appears like they're something on the surface moving very swift. Now, if you remember what I said, and you can go and look at this at the Baranoff and Zetalepin presentation given by Zetalepin in Sochi in uh, uh, 2019, is it 2018, October 2018. Uh, you can see him talking, I think it's on, on I think the presentation is called On rotation, Rotating Bodies or something like that. But anyway, um, in part of that presentation he has both some technologically produced ball lightning and some um, natural ball lightning and he is saying, uh, uh, from memory, and I might be wrong but you can go and check it on our uh, MFMP YouTube site, He's saying that they rotate on the outside at about 40 to 100,000 times per second. So uh, that is very fast and um, in fact it goes so fast that you can see blue shift on one side and red shift on the other which is interesting in its own right and that kind of it's, it's like uh, is it speeding up the light or slowing it down or is it polarizing the light that's something to think about. Um, but anyway uh, he's saying but it appears like there is something on the surface uh, uh, moving very fast, swirling type stuff. And then he also said, I blasted aluminium and copper between two tungsten sharp point, uh, pointed spark gap. So uh, this is what I was uh, referring to yesterday on, on the diagram and that was actually published in the Electric Space Cl Spacecraft Journal. And if I dig it up, I actually had that uh, in the bottom of my UFOs over Histalin 
uh, blog post that I did on Steam it a number of years ago. So let me just uh, find that particular drawing. So uh, it is here. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, this is the kind of like control logic uh, and uh, the spark gap here and so forth. And here is a kind of overview of the control circuitry and uh, uh, the main area. And so in this discharge gap here, um, I'm going to actually change my mouse pointer. So bear with me uh, for those that want to see a bigger mouse pointer. And I'll try and not do it with breaking stuff like I did way back when. So let me just see if I can do that quickly. Um, are you still hearing me? OK, please let me know. Um, Okay, so I need to do this. Uh -huh. Oh, bye bye. Okay, great, you can hear. Good. That's re reassuring, 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 reassuring. Is that even a thing? Great, okay. Yeah, it will be a little bit echoey. I, I will try and fix it. It is uh, running out of genuine USB ports that are attached to computers. Um, that is the uh, problem. But uh, I think the next attempt we shall be fine. So I'm just scaling up the cursor size here. Okay, this should be fine. Right, um, let's go back. So, uh, yeah, this is this uh, discharge gap here and uh, the plastic pipe with corona rings, and here's a close-up. So between these two tungsten points, uh, he had some aluminium or uh, copper that he was blasting uh, with the discharge, and that was yielding the um, ball lightning, which he was accelerating through here. Now, if you went back and looked at the presentation I requested that you did in the link here, uh, what it was um, uh, what it was saying is that if you have an electric discharge or, or uh, an intense uh, electrical inter uh, matter uh, uh, metals rather you had an ectonic explosion which is kind of like a columbic explosion and I talked about that in great great detail in that previous experiment but if you think about it all of the work of uh, uh, Tesla, for instance, the the uh, the death ray. If you remember, that is a dry steam jet going uh, 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 to make a open-ended vacuum tube. So the dry steam sort of uh, comes down, and you've got a tube, and it's open-ended, and that makes a vacuum in that tube. And then he fed in a tungsten wire or a mercury, which formed a tailor cone, and then had the discharge coming from there. So it was kind of a discharge into a vacuum through dry steam. And uh, this would produce, according to him, electrical particles of matter. Uh, and we know these now as exotic vacuum objects. But these are the same kind of uh, things that are described uh, by Messiatz, George Messiatz, in his ectons, which he presented in 1996 and then was promptly told that, I'm sorry, but this has already been patented by uh, Kenneth Radford Shoulders, having... Uh, been trying to explain what John Hutchison had done. So you see how these are all connected. But uh, he's not the only person that really thinks they rediscovered something. Uh, there is uh, this uh, person who I've talked about quite a lot in the past. Uh, and I will bring that up uh, when I switch my frame set. <laughs> and that is Leonid Reutzkev. So uh, we've got a frame coming up here. And uh, I've talked about this and there's several things that have uh, surmised on this presentation uh, slide. Uh, but what he had is he had this reaction chamber where he had typically a titanium foil. And above it, you can see here is this ball. And this is ball lightning. And he had a mirror that was at 45 degree angle. So you could see the top down view and this is the front view. So you could see it was pretty much a sphere and it has this kind of what I call zizzing when we're referring to it in Vega experiments, this zone on the outside and then the general glow. And so 
the, the interesting thing here is that this is outside of the reactor. And why is that interesting? Well, um, ball lightning is known to travel through glass, and I'll come to that. And I'm going to note that down, that I want to discuss that at the end, uh, glass, because we're going to see that referred to somewhere else. Um, and, and so it's able to travel through glass, but here you're seeing it traveling through uh, plastic, water, uh, metal, and so forth, uh, and forming on the outside of the reactor. Now, the interesting thing is, and someone asked me about this, how, did, how could this occur? Well, there are wires leading in, and we know, uh, and I've described this uh, about the PAP uh, explosion event, that in PAP's case, I believe that the reason it blew up was exotic vacuum objects must have been building up in his device. Uh, we know there are sparks, therefore there will be exotic vacuum objects. Uh, these will lead to, in my view, the uh, coherent uh, cold neutrinos, and these will embed themselves as uh, black evos into metals. And over, if they build up and they build up, they will then cause some metals to go to like jelly-like state. These, uh, in my view, are things that are not really magnetic. Uh, and in the case of higher melting point uh, materials or, or things like iron, um, they will do nothing until they do everything and they will just fracture. And I've explained in the past why I believe that is. And so when Feynman said, oh, I don't believe this is working and wanted to pull out this very thin wire that was going to the ground, I've described how, in my view, this was a drain to drain the excess EVOs to ground in the same way that Soviets would drain their uh, uh, EVOs in their metal when they were cold forming uh, um, uh, aluminium probably in their demonstrations to the team that was sent there uh, in 1992 by Tom Bearden. And uh, it's this draining process to, to get them to go to ground, because they like to go to ground, and we know this because ball lightning is, is, is a macro evo, and it likes to find ground. That is the basis of a lightning conductor. So if you can think about it, the, the PAT device failed because um, the, the, the excess exotic vacuum objects synthesized in there that were going into the metal body of the, the device weren't able to ground. And uh, when he held that, it was building up, it was building up, and then one plasmatic uh, explosion uh, caused the uh, weakened metal to fracture, and the um, piston head uh, most likely was the object that Feynman noticed was coming out as a silvery blob that then uh, um, did the damage to the people it hit, and, and it kind of went into a uh, it kind of went into a puff of white smoke. And so I imagine that that was a columbic explosion and a reaction with the oxygen in the air um, as the coherent blob of aluminium uh, uh, vaporized. And we know from the Salvatore Pi patterns that they are saying that they can get room temperature superconducting by having a piezoelectric material on uh, a block of aluminium and, and giving it pulses. And what, what that is doing, in my view, is uh, if it's going to be creating superconducting, we know that that is creating Cooper pairs, and Cooper pairs are coherent matter, aren't they? So, um, but it's maybe at a lower level. So th th these things are all uh, lining up. And so um, uh, it, this whole being able to travel down a very thin wire, I've, I've shown on Steam it in the past that another thing that was demonstrated to Tom Beard in, in 1992, or rather uh, his representatives, was this ability to transfer a large amount of power down a very thin wire. And in fact, I've shared a video in the past where in the 2000s, this was talked about on Russian television, and they had a spark gap, a Tesla coil, and they used an eight micron copper wire. This is a very, very thin uh, piece of copper wire. And they were then feeding that into, I think, 25 kilowatts of tungsten filament light bulbs. And th whatever was able to travel down that wire was traveling down that wire and then uh, disheveling and interacting with the, the, uh, um, the, the uh, tungsten filament in there. And I imagine that that was a, a dark mode Evo and that, that could be like a, a, um, a cluster of uh, coherent uh, um, electrons which are effectively acting like one electron so they don't have a lot of resistance. And they're, they're kept, up, kept in a, a body that is this neutral body and is able to pass through material. But in this case, it's traveling down a wire and trying to find ground. 
and um, it's, it's sweeping it along with it. Um, and, and then when it, when it gets destabilized by the slight magnetic field in, in the coils and, and, and the, the, the heat that they generate, then that destabilizes it and it, the electrons return to their, um, the single electron world, as Ken, Ken Shoulders would say. And uh, this is able to um, you know, produce all that electricity and that light in those devices. And I've also talked about how there may be some transportation going on at the same time. And then we have one other data point in Takaaki Matsumoto, not one other data point, but one other data point that I would like to discuss here, where he was um, uh, having uh, two anodes and, and, and so forth, and he was creating the ball lightning on the end, and he was turning this one off and having another one and having the, the ball lightning travel along uh, a conductor. And uh, it, this, this enabled him to uh, find tracks and saw that there was transmutation along the track to the other anode. And so the, these structures do like to follow a guide wire. And so what I'm suggesting then here is in this image that what's happening is a neutral uh, uh, cluster of cold neutrinos uh, or, or some form of neutral matter condensate is, is formed. Uh, it may have a single negative charge or, or certainly more, uh, much less than the amount of electrons that may, it may be carrying. And th this travels along the wires, and it, when it gets into the air, it gets excited uh, for some reason. It, and, and Ken Shoulders said that when things go through an impedance change, they um, get excited. And uh, you know, this is, in my view, why you see these on metal surfaces and, and so forth. This is the point at which there's a, a change in impedance, and they get excited and they start to reveal themselves. And so. Um, this is coming out. Now, what do we know about uh, the, the rest of this work that he did? Well, um, he observed uh, what we now know as these uh, magnetic monopoles. And in fact, he, he provided a large uh, proportion of the proof of that because he used iron 57 and he had a, a, a one piece of iron 57 with a south pole on the back of it. And it attracted a change in the fine uh, structure of the iron 57 uh, um, uh, relative to a north pole added and and then he had a north on another piece and that added uh, had a change uh, to the south pole and they actually discussed that on here so um, since both north and south magnetic monopoles must appear the foils under study were located near different poles of a strong magnet with a magnetic field strength uh, of this in anticipation of selection of monopoles Thus, N monopoles were expected to attract by the S pole and S monopoles by the N pole of the magnet. The magnets were set at a distance of 70 centimeters away from the site of the electric explosion. So it's not just that he was, uh, um, it was in this uh, container with the water and the polymer and the, the metal or whatever. It's also going through 70 centimeters of air. So this is not the normal radiation you would think about. A third foil was used as a standard. Due to a large magnetic charge, the monopoles captured in the trap, it must change the magnetic field near the 57 iron nucleus, which can be measured by Mossbauer effect. And essentially, it concludes here um, that uh, it did do the change and so forth. So uh, why is this important? Well, uh, there's one, one last data point here that I need to bring up, and, th and that is the actual... Uh, uh, link that I have here, which I'm going to get get up for you, uh, because that show is connecting three m major dots together, uh, which uh, are relevant uh, to the discussion here. Okay, so uh, <laughs> this is the. Uh, paper and it's uh, Annals Fondation Le Louis de Broglie uh, from 2002. Uh, are we still hearing me and stuff? Okay. So, um, Leonid Ritzkev, uh, Lis Sonov, uh, Lix Sonov, and uh, uh, Shinoev. I'm probably mullering those names. I'm very sorry about that. Um, uh, anyway, we will do our best uh, to. Uh, give them the credit they deserve. Okay, so um, this this was this exploding foils and um, here's your container. So you had uh, the uh, foil, which is uh, number four. Uh, five is the electrode here. 
Then around that, you had uh, whatever this is. This is uh, something here. They've got four, which is uh, so uh, smart get cable electrode. So they had a polyethylene cover, seal, explosion chamber, and distilled water. So you had dis distilled water, uh, polyethylene cover, and I think this is um, the overall thing. Anyway, what, what I'm saying, you capacitor discharge into this metal foil and you have all this material and for some reason whatever it is that's generated in there produces a ball lightning above and uh, you have these metal foils at some distance away but um, that is not the point that I want to draw your attention to so these are various ball lightnings that were created during their experiment and you can go and have a look at this and I will sh share the presentation slides and you'll have the links in there but I I've shared all this before in my monopole clutch video um, but the interesting thing here that, that I want to draw your attention to is not just the fact that we've got transmutation going on here. So we have ball lightning, transmutation, and uh, the ball lightning is appearing outside of the device. Uh, but we also have down the bottom here, and so these, these are the plates where the magnetic monopoles were captured at a distance of 0.7 a meter. We also have strange radiation tracks captured with this spiraling broke up spiral very much like the uh, Hestal and lights that I was referring to in yesterday's uh, presentation and so uh, you, you look at this particular thing here and it's like a miniature version of what you see in the Hestal and lights and what we saw in the bull lightning from aid from the Australian outback so th there we go uh, and in fact if I can get to it, I have a another spectra from Hestalen lights from another ball lightning there. And in that case, it's a ball lightning that is not produced during lightning events. And I want to discuss that. So um, Hest I'll write that down right now because I want to come to that. And it's half of the point of why I'm going through what I'm going through now. Uh, OK, so look at look at this uh, close up of uh, one of the segments here. And let's go and look at the Hestalen ball lightning. Uh, um, capture uh, up here and I will uh, zoom that out so so here we go look look at what you're seeing here this kind of squiggle here th these broken squiggles here let's let's zoom into that look look at this particular structure here the, with the gap and the little M and the gap and the little M I call them M and M's um, and we'll go over to here Here's your gap and your M, your gap and your M. So th this is the same kind of thing. And uh, with David and Henk, we've create, captured these, in my view, uh, live on film. Uh, um, so uh, that's that. And then they've also got some other tracks, um, which I think are relevant to just look at quickly. Uh -huh. So here's some other tracks. And there's some other ones that they found here. And these comet trail type ones uh, are very similar to the ones shown by Bogdanovich. And I want to talk about Bogdanovich later as well. I didn't put that into the presentation. Okay. So, so uh, why is everything I'm sharing with you so important? Well, th this particular work of Leonid Oretzkev uh, and his colleagues um, it ties together the fact that ball lightning can be initiated by a uh, ecton type process so an exploding metal foil and in fact in the previous work I referred to the fact that um, uh, um, not, not a red scarf, uh, that um, uh, God, I'm going to get it mixed up. Anyway, uh, the guy I'm talking about uh, um, <laughs> at the beginning, um, he, um, uh, Messiat, sorry, Messiat. <laughs> uh, Messiat uh, is showing that, that exploding foils is one of the examples that produce uh, ectons. And these are also obviously producing exotic vacuum objects. So let's say these are producing e ectons. They are producing ball lightning. And, uh, and then um, the ball lightning and the ectons, they are producing something that is coming out, which it has magnetic monopolar nature. Uh, it's able to pass through matter. 
and uh, it is able to produce strange radiation tracks. Now, the Russians, uh, if you look at the, a new form of penetrating radiation by Shishkin on the MFMP channel, uh, they spent about nine years from 2009 to 2018 uh, researching this in, to a huge degree. And they concluded that um, Ken Shoulders was right um, and Shishkin called this magnetotoro electrical radiation and that the neutral form of it, string vortex solitons, uh, were potentially condensed, cold, cl uh, condensed uh, clusters of uh, cold neutrinos. And in my view, they need to be coherent in, in order to do that as well. And um, this is, uh, I've, I've talked about how um, uh, there are, this history all, spanning all the way back to the Wheeler paper from the 1950s um, that says that kind of this kind of thing is possible. So uh, what I'm saying is that something is coming out of the reactor and that it produces strange radiation it produces magnetic monopoles and it produces ball lightning and it's from exploding foil. Now, what was John Hutchison doing? Well, he was taking the tungsten electrodes and he was putting aluminium or he was putting uh, uh, copper in between and giving it a blast of electrical power. He's effectively exploding, exploding a foil or he has metal in the middle of that and that is basically the description for Messiats for creating a, uh, um, uh, an ecton, a columbic explosion of uh, electrons. And um, this is essentially what was in the Tesla death uh, ray device. And so the whole thing is connected together. And uh, you can probably imagine uh, um, with this level of understanding how quickly you could develop all kinds of devices that would produce the same effect. And uh, so, so with that, um, I want to uh, draw your attention to um, uh, this, which I've, I've shared a good number of times. And this is the production of cold neutrinos. And it, it's uh, done by um, our good friend, uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander Parkamov. And he is saying that if you have things at a high temperature, uh, then you will have the matter uh, and that is all of the particles of matter in there, the electrons, the ions, uh, and, and the, the nuclei, they're, they're all uh, of sufficient energy such that when they collide, um, they're over 0.28 of an EV uh, when you're over 1,000 degrees. Uh, there is a proportion of them over at 0.28 uh, EV, and that is able to produce the type of cold neutrinos that he used in his experiments, and that can trigger... Um, beta decay and it's inverse beta decay and then if you add particular elements in there like potassium which contains a proportion of potassium 40 or carbon which uh, contains a proportion of carbon 14 then you can cause via these cold neutrinos the uh, inverse beta decay and this produces monochromatic electrons i.e. all of the electrons are at the exactly the same energy and this means that they are ready to cohere because what is important it's for the wavelength of the matter to be in sync and uh, have the same exact same energy so they are uh, able to to cohere and that's the principles uh, laid out in the Lockheed Martin 2013 patent and so it's kind of a fast track so it's this kind of logic uh, and I will uh, go into why this is important when we're talking about glass so th there's two things. When we want to create ball lightning, um, we want to take this into consideration. And when we want to understand ball lightning, uh, we want to take it into consideration. And the, the two things there are the, the, the glass. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about that when we go through uh, something in a, few, in a second. So there's something relative to glass and the passing through of uh, um, ball lightning. Um, and there, there is, um, when you're trying to synthesize ball lightning, you need to use the, uh, quite simply, you need to use carbon uh, that is what I would call live. So um, uh, I suggested to David Boutlier uh, that when he is creating, trying to create uh, ball lightning, he should put some candles around his uh, reactor, uh, sorry, his uh, Tesla um, ball. Uh, 
Specifically, these would be beeswax candles. And the reason I'm saying that is that paraffin wax candles comes from what I call, if it comes from uh, hydrocarbons from under the ground, these are, in my view, dead uh, 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 hydrocarbons. That the carbon has got no or little carbon-14. It's the carbon-14 rich carbon that you want. Uh, uh, and that would be in, for instance, beeswax candles. So, um, uh, and you'll see why that's relevant in a minute. I'll talk more about the glass passing through and, 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 and how that plays in uh, with what ball lightning is doing. And it's, this is a huge reveal. You do not want to miss that. Uh, I think that this is something that's never been explained before. And I think I, I, I came up with it a couple, couple of years, two or three years back. And, and uh, I think it's the right time to, to walk through this it's Cofola, it's a, a Czech brand of fake cola if you didn't see me drink it before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my point here is, um, so David Boutlier and, um, uh, well actually John Hutchison when he was referring to his ball lightning generator said that he uh, did a lot of his work by referring back to the, um, uh, I think it's uh, Colorado Springs I think it's Colorado Springs, um, uh, notes of, of Tesla. And this was interesting because uh, when the video that I'm going to show you in a little while was sent to me uh, a, a year or so ago by David Boutlier, uh, he also referred to someone else that he had used for inspiration. I didn't actually go and look it up at the time, but I have done that uh, yesterday. I skim read it, unfortunately, and now I'm going to read it with you uh, real time, and I'm going to pull out uh, the uh, uh, what I feel are the important things from this. Like I said, skim read it. I don't really know much of what it says, but essentially this is um, from James Corum and uh, Kenneth Corum, and uh, it was published in the Electric Space Spacecraft Journal in August the fifth, two thousand and three, uh, and this is something. Uh, that, uh, as I understand it, was the basis for the uh, video that you're going to see in a little while, and I will uh, go through it now. So, um, can everyone still hear me? And the camera hasn't died, so that's reassuring. Okay. Can canuba wax? Yeah. And any live live carbon source. So I'm using live carbon source in the form of charcoal in my supernova experiments and so forth. So it's, it's important to have live uh, charcoal. Um, okay, so James and uh, Kenneth Curran searched the historical records for clues as to how Tesla was able to generate fireballs on demand. They discovered that operating two different frequency coils placed inside primary made this possible. They also found that airborne, airborne, oh, here we go, Airborne carbon or metal particulates enhances this effect. Right, well, um, why would that be? Well, they would uh, not... Um, this is kind of what they, uh, Dr. George Eagley would call a dusty plasma. If you have a metal particle in the air uh, and you have... Uh, or carbon, uh, this would have charge on its surface. And if you've got a discharge coming to it, it would then have a different charge and then there would be a charge potential between two things which would cause another discharge. But effectively, what you're doing is you're creating a micro environment of what John Hutchison was doing with a piece of metal in between two uh, tungsten electrodes. And in fact, when you do an exploding foil or an exploding wire like Ruitskev is doing, when you discharge into that, you not only get a pinch plasma as, you, as it happens, you also get this vaporization of the metal. And so momentarily after the discharge starts, you actually have metal particles in the gap. So there you go. It's, it's the same thing as apparently Tesla was doing. And in fact, it's actually the same thing as S.V. Adamenko is doing. You've got a discharge into a little piece of metal and that, that will cause your columbic explosion. So it's, it's all the same thing. So let's let's read on. Curious as to why so few Tesla coilers had seen fireballs with Tesla reported that uh, when Tesla reported them as common, 
and sometimes almost menacing occurrence, Kenneth and James Coram scrutinised photographs published with Tesla's Colorado Spring Notes. Ah, there we go. So, so uh, David Boutlier referred me to the Coram Notes, and the Coram Notes refer to the Colorado Spring Notes, and um, this is what I was told was the basis for John Hutchison's exploration, and uh, uh, he obviously created Ball Lightning as well, and on file at the Tesla Museum in Belgrade. Their investigation revealed that their experimental apparatus hadn't exactly emulated Tesla's setup as it appeared in numerous photographs and diagrams. Perhaps the most important feature overlooked was the surrounding of multiple resonators by a single primary coil. Another feature conductive, uh, conducive rather, to fireball production was the addition of a pointed wire to the upper terminal or extra coil. Okay, so with, we know that the pointed wire will lead to the production of exotic vacuum objects when you get a discharge. In fact, all sparks will do, but this will focus uh, the delivery of where the uh, uh, energy will be produced. And that's the whole point of having a very slight curvature on your sphere or your toroid, because uh, they have minimum surface curvature, and so you can build up the maximum amount of static uh, or electric charge on them, whether it's a Van de Graaff generator or a Tesla coil, uh, before it will discharge into the air. Whereas when you have a point, that will provide the focus. If you have a big build-up, if it's going to discharge anywhere, it will discharge from that point. And that leads you to some predictability as to where your uh, active material or your additional material needs to be. Okay, so system design. Figure 2 shows the Corum's revis uh, revised experimental configuration. Tesla patented this concept in 1897 and patented, patented a, related, uh, a related communications application a few years later. The design consists of two dissimilar quarter wavelengths. Okay, so basically um, it's this one here. I have a, a, a blow up here. So uh, uh, David Boutlier can probably talk about this in much more detail, um, but basically you have your coil, your primary I guess, that goes around both of these two uh, Tesla coils and these are um, different numbers of turns and so forth, so forth. Uh, there might be different frequencies and so forth. So um, you've got to have frequency interference going on here and cross talk and, and that might be critical uh, to how this works. And remember the second order effects that were being discussed about the, in the Chinese paper from the uh, high, high tension uh, uh, 50 hertz uh, supply that was in their mountain of, or their plateau location. And that might have been working with some other uh, aspect going on. So it might be similar to what's going on here in some aspects. But anyway, let's go back to the, the uh, commentary here. So in their research, the Corums noticed that secondary coil operates in two alternating modes during Tesla coil operation. While the primary coil is sparking, i.e. the circuit is closed, the secondary operates in a regime that can be modeled using lumped element circuit analysis. This is characterized by beats, beats, okay, so this is like sound beats between uh, uh, different frequencies of sound uh, from the superposition of oscillations from both coils. So yeah, there's crosstalk between the two, uh, current versus time trace. Above a critical level of magnetic coupling, the frequency-based trace is characterized by two voltage peaks. There we go, two voltage peaks, where the time between peaks decreases with tighter coupling. Okay, interesting, interesting. Set up for generating ball lightning with... Okay, uh, okay. So, um, when the spark across the primary gap is extinguished, the secondary passes into a regime where which it behaves as a quarter-wave helical resonator requiring distributed element circuit analysis. This mode is characterized by a single standing wave oscillating at the secondary's natural frequency. In this regime, the secondary can be accurately modeled as a simple transmission line to show how even casually constructed setups can magnify voltage by at least 10 to 50 times. So you're already looking at super high voltage, but what they're saying is under this mode, you get a higher voltage by 10 to 50 times. So it's really pumping up that voltage. The maximum voltage at the top of the coil is simply the product of induced voltage and the VSWR and the mag magnification achieved from applying good engineering to increase the VSWR. I don't even know what that is, but uh, David Boutlier, you can comment in the, the blog here. Um, uh, far outweighs any gaze obtainable from switching to a better, higher power oscillator. Basically the same measures 
uh, that would be applied to enhance the output of a top-loaded vertical antenna may also be applied to resonant transformer. The only significant difference is that Tesla coils are short enough to render radiation resistance negligible. Okay, so um, uh, John Hutchison uh, was going for, if we look at his comments here, uh, very high voltage, extremely high discharges. He was saying, uh, I could dump 150... Thousand volts DC powered by a Siemens 400,000 X-ray transformer. Okay, so he and he could also do uh, 500 joules, 25,000 watts, uh, low inductance type. So he was really uh, a lot of joules. So 500 joules. I think it's 300 joules that um, uh, SV Adamenko uses, but 25,000 watts. So it's, it's it's a lot of power in a very short duration or very very high volts. So I, I think the, the, the desire is to get a, as much electrons as you can into your target uh, as fast as possible. Same, same logic applied uh, to S.V. Adamenko, whose first experiment and all subsequent experiments worked according to its claims. Um, uh, and you're just going to get electron bunching. Electron bunching leads to coherence, and coherence leads to condensation, and, and uh, condensation leads to uh, you know the increase in in heat, and you get the, the cold neutrinos and so forth. So um, uh, it's all kind of coming together. So okay, the currents are tested that a good design is attainable by simply fo simply by following Tesla's instructions reiterated in numerous public disclosures. Whereas Tesla's data from pertinent experiments indicate that he was operating his coils as quarter wave resonators, the Corams have found that most Tesla coilers run theirs like reciprocating engines with poor timing. <laughs> Maximum benefits can be achieved simply by one, making the spark duration compatible with the apparatus coupling coefficients and two, preventing resonator losses mostly caused by using too many turns and or too high a gauge of wire. Okay, so it's all good tips here. The quorums tuned their circuits so that in distributed resonator mode, the lower frequency coil would output maximum voltage of 2.4 megavolts at, at a resonant frequency of 67 kilohertz and the higher frequency coil 200 kilovolts at 156 kilohertz. The coherence time for each resonator or the time required to establish a standing wave upon excitation of the primary spark was respectively 72 microseconds and 30 microseconds. Okay. All right. Well, th these, are, these are the technical details. You can look at these in your own time. Uh, it's on Tesla Universe. Um, results. The Coorums used two variations of their setup to consistently produce fireballs, and the results agreed with Tesla's observations and explanations. A quote from Tesla can be used to explain the quorum's uh, observations from operating the setup as illustrated. So uh, I'm assuming that this is a quote from Tesla. I might need to go in a little bit bigger. Right. So sorry if you are um, uh, tired with me just reading this, but uh, from my point of view, this is the first time I've read it. And um, I think I want to uh, do it this way, if that's OK with you. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to make that a little bit bigger so maybe you can read that. The fireballs result from the interaction of two frequencies, a stray higher frequency wave imposed on the lower frequency oscillations of the main circuit. As the free oscillation builds up from the zero point to the quarter wavelength node, it passes through various rates of change in a current of shorter wavelength. The rates of change will be steeper and a second oscillator may be used to transmit a shorter wavelength current. When the two currents re react on each other, the resultant complex will contain a wave in which there is an extremely steep rate of change. And I've discussed this in the past. The way to create EVOs, the way to create uh, uh, ectons, uh, uh, all these kind of things, is to have the fastest uh, rate of change you can get with your uh, electrons. And this is exactly what S.V. Adamenko was doing when he uh, had this plasma bridge uh, uh, device to create a relativistic discharge and, and it produced a, a discharge at one tenth of C. And for the briefest instant, currents may move at tremendous rate, at a rate of millions of horsepower. This condition acts as a trigger which may cause the total energy of the powerful longer wave to be discharged in an infinitesimally small interval of time. 
and at a proportionality, uh, uh, proportionately tremendous greater rate of energy movement, which cannot confine itself to the metal circuit and is released into surrounding space with inconceivable violence. Okay, so he's basically describing what Arutzkev was achieving. And remember, um, Arutzkev blew up wires, okay, or foils. He was creating ball lightning. So same thing, different different location, sim simpler uh, uh, setup, really. Just discharge, doing more what uh, John Hutchinson was doing, discharging a large amount of energy into a small space, exactly the same as S.V. Adamenko. And bearing in mind, S.V. Adamenko created every element in the periodic table. He also was able to remediate nuclear waste, and he was also able to produce strange radiation as well from those explosive events. And so... Everything is basically the same. Okay, so going back. Uh, in the Corum's experiment, the energy brushed off the pointed terminus on the low frequency resonators via streamers and bubbles. After observing, photographing and videotaping the generation of these bubbles on numerous occasions, the Corum's were well qualified to make generalizations about their appearance and evolution. Generally speaking, the bubbles would first appear as nodules, less than a centimetre in diameter, somewhere along the length of the streamer. These nodules would slowly glide along the streamer, away from the resonator coil. At some point, they would become fixed in space and increase in luminosity. So this, this right here, sounds like they've got to some sort of node, uh, probably between the two r resonant coil or, or, or out of uh, uh, frequency coils. So would become fixed in space and increase in luminosity as the stream would fade away. Subsequent streamers appear to be attracted to the balls. Okay, let's hold that point in mind. Subsequent streamers be, seem to be attracted to the balls. So when we go and look at what uh, David Boutlier did, we're going to refer to this. So so that's point one. Let's, let's think about that. Uh, subsequent uh, streamers attract two balls okay that's point one I think we need to bear in mind and with each successive stream of strike the balls grow in luminous intensity so this is like they are attracting the electrons to them they're almost like they are an anode so let's hold that in mind when we look at David Boutier's experiment and see if we can see something that makes it appear as if the ball lightning is acting as an anode. So let's have a question there. Is uh, BL acting as virtual anode? Because if it is, and we can make a free floating fireball, we can feed it and maintain it if we're able to hold it in some sort of cradle. A sort of cradle that, well, Ken Shoulders described a cradle, and I think he used a penning trap where you had a magnetic field and an electric static field um, combined, and this allowed you to hold this thing in free space. And then if you could have one of these things in free space, you could keep feeding it. And uh, that, that's very interesting. So, uh, okay, so where were we? Blah, 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 blah. At some point, they would become fixed in space. Subsequent streamers appear to be attracted to the balls. And with each successive st streamer strike, the balls grew in luminous intensity. Without reinforcing strikes, the fireballs would survive. Okay, here we go. Listen to this. Look at that. Without reinforcing strikes, the fireballs would survive for only one to two seconds. Listen to what Ken Shoulders said to John Hutchison in the 2010 video that I uh, transcribed. He said, that you can hold these things and you if you, you can feed them and you can feed them and you know they will grow and they will grow but if you don't feed them they will fade away they will fade away so they like electrons they want electrons and he says they become an electron and this is exactly what you're seeing described here without reinforcing strikes the fireballs would survive for only one to two seconds interesting interesting so it's a, the same phenomena fireballs generated by this means can be spherical oh oh hold on <laughs> look at <laughs> what are we seeing here what are we seeing here oh dear there's nothing new in heaven and earth 
fireballs generated by this means can be spherical or toroidal. Spherical or toroidal. I rest my case. <laughs> this is exactly the conclusion of the work of Takaaki Matsumoto that his microball lightning or his ectonic, sorry, his uh, uh, um, itonic clusters uh, took two forms, spherical or toroidal. There we go. We have another party, basically the same type of family of reactions and technology, and they are observing spherical or toroidal structures. Why is that? I've explained that it's a surface tension thing and that it's the minimum surface uh, for the maximum volume and uh, uh, minimum ability to radiate. It is what you would do if you were self-organizing. It's what you would do. There we go. <laughs> oh, I just love it. Uh, in accordance with the remarks in Tesla's notes, they're usually one to three centimeters in diameter and, and often larger. The quorums observed fireballs of a variety of colours spanning the visible spectrum and soon noticed their development followed the hertzsprung russell like sequence. Beginning as red dwarfs, the balls change colour and size until they reach bluish-white giant stage. If they don't explode, aha, this is what Ken Shoulder's saying, if you feed it too much, they'll explode. Like Nova, there we go, like Nova. I, I, I would suggest they're exploding, like Nova. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what... What, what uh, Matsumoto is saying is like, they build and they build and they build, and when you get to a certain level, you have an electronuclear collapse, and then it goes boom, and it, I imagine it's, it's literally like that, it goes ee, Okay, like Nova, they degenerate to red giant status and then fade out. As with stars, the color of the fireballs is probably an indication of their plasma temperature. Continuing to the stellar analogy, instances of revolving sunspots and pulsar behavior were not uncut. What? Con continuing to the, the stellar analogy, instances of revolving sunspots and pulsar behavior were not uncommon. <laughs> I'm enjoying reading this for the first time with you guys. <laughs> A little air pollution went a long way towards increasing the number of fireballs observed. Appropriate levels of smoke have been generated by placing a candle on top of the low frequency resonator. Or in Tesla's day, following his recommendations to hold a cable insulated with rubber near the resonator. The idea that carbon, a common element in wax, paraffin and old fashioned rubber, um, did they have much hydrocarbon based uh, carbon in 1890s? Did they? I don't know. You tell me. Was it was it, was there a lot of uh, you know petroleum based? <laughs> I don't know whether there was, but anyway, wax, paraffin, and old fashioned rubber is important. So rubber, we know, we know rubber, old fashioned rubber, is a natural compound. Uh, you know, I've seen rubber trees till my, I've seen a lot when I was living in India. And that will have active carbon in there, live carbon. Depends on the wax, uh, what the wax is, but like I say, beeswax would do. Okay, is important if not essential. Is important if not essential to fireball formation. Interesting. Is further reinforced by historical accounts of ball lightning occurring around chimneys and erupting volcanoes. Okay, so... If you actually look at ball lightning description on uh, um, uh, Wikipedia, they talk about it being a dusty plasma type effect. And in fact, obviously that's what we're doing in the supernova reactors to create ball lightning in there. And as I've described it, you get these different charges and uh, they form discharge, discharges within them. So you've got a charged particle here and then that can discharge to another one and every discharge is gonna be uh, producing EVOs which are causing pinches which are then gonna cause uh, the, the production of cold neutrinos. Research indicates that fireball production is a multi-step electrochemical process and carbon appears to be, uh, uh, carbon appears only to incubate already existing. I would agree with that. Carbon appears only to incubate already existing microscopic fireballs to observable sizes. Okay, I agree with that entirely. Now, 
Then is the carbon a fuel in combination with oxygen in the air. And I'm going to come back to the importance of oxygen where I have said it, that it is important as a means to help form the clusters. And uh, essentially what that is, is if you look at Leonid Aritzka paper uh, and his colleagues with regard to what happened at Chernobyl, he is saying that oxygen in the water captured these magnetic monopoles, which are cold neutrino condensates, which are magnetically charged. They went in and bound themselves to the oxygen in the water. This caused a magnetic fluid that caused the, the pipes in Chernobyl to smash themselves off the wall and, 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 and metal containers to get all contorted. And then the other thing is that they went into the air above the reactor and they caused a change in the spectral lines as was, he didn't refer to this, but as was observed during three body alignments uh, in the work of Xu Wenzhou et al. in China between 1988 and 1999. And this is the fact that the transition uh, uh, levels between excited uh, oxygen and nitrogen, uh, but it's oxygen, uh, principally because it's this paramagnetic nuclei um, that that changes uh, and so you get weird glow that you wouldn't ordinarily experience without a large uh, flux of cold neutrinos and so um, uh, I, I believe that the auction and I'm going to make this argument for where things occur and uh, and uh, the nature of the paramagnetic nature, which I've discussed in a previous presentation, but there's a factor that changes depending on where you are. And I think this is very important. So carbon appears uh, only to incubate already existing macroscopic, microscopic fireballs to observable sizes. Vaporizing metals at the resonator terminus can produce the same effect. Okay, so it, it, it's all the same thing. Uh, the quorum soon noticed that if they injected airborne particles into the experiment in experimental environment, they could create fireballs with only one resonator coil. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so for David Boutlier, th this is very, very useful information, I, I would suggest. This led, uh, led to the conclusion that plasma ball generation is optimized by rapidly discharging one to two million volts per meter electric field through a dense smog of carbon or metal particulars. In a second setup, only a, the low frequency coil was employed and a carbon film was deposited on its high voltage terminus. This is kind of what uh, uh, David Boutlier did. So he took his, uh, you can't see what I'm showing here. Um, he took his uh, uh, Tesla ball and you can see it, you'll see it in a minute. And uh, he um, had that, um, coated with aluminium foil and he had carbon on there okay um, but sl slightly different setup to what they're suggesting here during operation current resist resistive resistively heated the carbon and the associated power loss rapidly created a region of low impedance at the electrode where streamers and fireballs were observed as before so here's a fireball uh, the next step was to see if artificially generated fireballs behaved in accordance with accounts of encounters with ball lightning. In one notable scenario, the quorums wanted to see if the fireballs would pass through a wind... Ah, here we go. In one notable example, the quorums wanted to see if fireballs would pass through a window pane, as many witnesses claim. Using the two resonator circuit, they generated a plethora of fireballs, which indeed appeared to pass through the glass until scrutinized with the stop frame photography. Whereas in real time, the fireballs seemed to pass through the glass on stop frame video, new fireballs appeared to form on the opposite side of the window when struck by a streamer as the old ones faded. Okay, okay, this is, this is very important. So this I think is the point three. Point three uh, is that they are saying here, uh, on stop frame video, new fireballs appeared to form on the opposite side of the window when struck by a stream. Okay, I, I know how to answer this one already. So passing through glass. And what I will say right now is not all glass is the same. Not all glass is the same. We know this very well from our first experiment using the uh, uh, Chalani wires. He said he was going to go to using fused quartz, which is pure silicon dioxide. 
We did that. The reason was you could raise the temperature of the wires and the environment to a higher degree because otherwise the borosilicate glass would melt and start to soften around about 300 and something degrees centigrade. So we did what he suggested he was going to do next and we saw no excess heat. So what we thought is we're breaking our first rule of replication which is to try and do something different from what worked and so we went back to using borosilicate glass and on 12 seconds past 12 minutes past 12 on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th California time, we started an experiment that two days later yielded 12.5% excess heat. And I put that down to the fact that there was boron in the glass. There's also lithium. And why is that important? Well, both boron and lithium interact with neutral particles. The most common particle you will think about is the neutron. But the Russians call these cold neutrino condensates uh, or the things that produce strange radiation or that seem to appear in neutron detectors, uh, uh, but if they're differently biased, uh, fake neutrons. OK, and so um, it could be that they interact and, and because they get slowed or they get they're, they're able to dump their energy. Or in the case of uh, uh, if they're carrying protons with them and uh, they're going into boron 11, maybe they're creating carbon 12 and that's producing some energy. Or maybe uh, if there's lithium in there, they could be producing beryllium 8, producing 2, 4 helium and that's producing energy. Um, or it's just stopping and the energy that would otherwise be lost, the kinetic energy, is captured into that glass. But for whatever reason, it interacts with glass. Now, why is that important? It's important because when uh, uh, David Hudson had his thumb-sized electrode uh, uh, in his electric arc furnace go poof and disappearing uh, when he was trying to deal with Ormus, uh, he found that the glass around his lab, the glassware in his lab, uh, uh, crumbled. And that, in my view, is because that glassware uh, was probably borosilicate glass and this was the strange radiation flat flux coming out of these uh, uh, um, uh, structures which are recorded by Rutzkev and other authors uh, including uh, Adamenko coming out interacting with that glass and call, causing that glass to uh, fragment. Okay so um, now the other thing that I think we'll, we'll, we'll want to look at and I'm going to just, just put my note there with the passing through glass thing is another aspect of glass and some glasses the, the ball lightning passes through and some glasses it doesn't but I'm going to bring up Bogdanovich and we're going to look at his uh, paper uh, uh, Bogdanovich I think from 2019 Bogdanovich okay because uh, he he in his um, uh, experiments there uh, found something similar. So we'll come to that shortly. The Corum speculated that fireballs are rarely seen in nature because the streamers of lightning strikes are normally spawned somewhere in the clouds. Okay, so that, this is this is interesting. Look at this. Look at look at what you're seeing here. You can just about see the streamer here, and you see a node here. Streamer here. Node. Streamer. Node. Streamer. Node. Fa fairly equidistant here. And here's a whole string of nodes here. Now I have seen this kind of structures um, in nature. Where have I seen it? I've seen it in chains of stars. Now, the, I guess the electric universe would argument would say this is a flux of, of electron, or, you know, or you've got some uh, filaments going here. Um, but also we know that uh, neutrinos are gravitationally lensed and so this could literally be a stream of, of neutrinos and electrons combined and uh, these nodes are you know what I'm looking at there could quite easily be a star constellation and you've got the feeders the streamers feeding them it's quite special really when you just look at it from that that level so far, the two methods described above are the only two means of repeatedly generating artificial bull lightning. Well, that's not true because Ritzkev was creating it every day, <laughs> any day of the week by exploding metal foils in water, by the way, um, uh, uh, on demand. The quorum's knowledge uh, of slow wave transmission line theory applied to Tesla's extensive documentation of plasma ball production led not only to the rediscovery of this technique, but also the first credible scientific explanation of the process. Once again, Tesla has been shown 
Not uh, to be correct, he specified the conditions necessary and the sufficient for artificial fireball generation to be at high power discharge, capable of heating airborne particulates to incandescence. Okay, all right, so fine. Okay, so I, I probably, okay. Uh, so I think I'm gonna deal with the last point that we raised there, which is the passing through glass. And I'm gonna do that by looking up Bogdanovich's um, uh, paper. Uh, from 2019 and just showing you something in there which I think is absolutely critical um, so let me find that talk amongst yourselves uh, if you've got any questions now uh, well strange right so Jason saying I, I think Bob said that strange radiation is a black Evo but I might be wrong so um, Strange radiation, we've observed the same kind of thing, which I believe it's coherent tra matter traveling wave. And in, in the Vega experiments, we can actually, uh, Dave and Hank, and, and I've worked with them and captured frames and linked them together. And you can see that uh, they are the same structures as the structures that, uh, uh, sorry, the same structures as the things that have been observed as witness marks in a range of materials, both inside and outside of re reactors and at distance from a reactor. And so it, 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 it's pretty, pretty strong evidence that it's the same structure. Now, is it that when the coherent matter traveling wave is, it, maybe it's still neutral, but uh, we know that uh, uh, cold neutrinos, uh, neutrinos in general, but cold neutrinos can interact with electrons and they can share energy between them. It might be as the, the, the coherent cold neutrinos, if that's all they are at that stage, travels through the hot, plasma gas it gets excited or excites the gas or there's an energy interchange so you see them and then when it leaves the gas you don't see them but they carry on their merry way or it might be that they they are carrying some electrons with them that haven't fully condensed and they're radiating energy and so you you see them at that point but at some point these things can become dark and Ken Shoulders talked about this and then they can pass through matter and it doesn't really matter what the matter is. Oh God, mixing up my matters there. Um, <laughs> and, and come out. And But then they can get excited at an impedance change. And typically you see um, a, a strange radiation will either run along a surface or hit the surface and go straight through or hit the surface and then turn 90 degrees and, and travel along it. And we've also seen the behaviours of when these things are interacting. They basically don't do anything. And then when they get close, they do everything. They like almost instantaneously react uh, and uh, uh, interact with each other. And you see this in all the kind of traces. And you can also see we've, we've caught them live where they've split and come apart. And so you have two things that look exactly the same frequency squiggles, uh, just like uh, Zhigolov had observed in, in um, uh, emissions. Uh, captured from the 225 day reactor and the the um, uh, woodpecker sparking device and so yes the, but they they are themselves if you can imagine you have a a a, a uh, ectonic explosion or you have a coherent matter fireball and then it destabilizes and explodes like these uh, uh, um, people are talking about here um, that when it explodes some fraction of those because it, it, it isn't necessarily totally always a coherent, uh, single coherent structure, or when it breaks, packets of those uh, waves can come off and, and they've got some imparted energy from the explosive event and they travel off in a, in, in a direction and they may or may not be transporting matter with them at the same time. And so uh, I've argued in the past that you might find uh, material teleported and someone thinks that it's actually, um, you know, uh, I don't know if it's Still, is it still broadcasting? Because I've got something saying uh, currently offline. So I don't know whether that's true. Um, hold on, I think I've gone offline. Uh, I'm recording locally if there's a problem. Can someone tell me whether I'm still here? Uh, dear, okay. I don't know whether I'm still here. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can find this Bogdanovich. Okay. I'm still here, am I? Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> there is a buffer and it might feed the buffer, but it momentarily went offline. So, okay, I'm gonna find this Bogdanovich, otherwise I won't find it and then I'll just be talking. Um,
Okay. So I should be able to show you this. No, we didn't want to do that. You are not going to want to miss the video at the end of this presentation and everything should make sense and we'll go through it together. And, uh, okay, so, one of the paper is, is it here? Uh, okay, I don't want to go there, I want to go there. No, don't do this. Okay, I think we got it here. This is if I'd had more time, I'd have had this all ready for you. Okay. Okay, so, uh, video recording of long-lived plasmoids near objects exposed to remote direct effects of high current pinch discharges. There we go, lovely. So this is a water flow discharge uh, and uh, onto a metal plate. And we see, what do we see? We see uh, spheres like this structure here. And you can't quite see it here, but this is a toroid. Here's some other spheres of different kind of scales. There are also these strands. Um, and we talked about those in the past. But there was this one, and this was two days afterwards. Uh, it's a toroid that's spinning and traveling around on the metal plate. And this is a cluster of them, and they apparently captured videos of these. And this is spinning around. So, uh, and they even talk about this, that, that this is like ball lightning. So you've got substructures, and you can imagine that if this thing blew up, then these substructures would go off. And depending on the kinetics of the explosion, they would have their own wave function on them. Uh, and if they otherwise didn't really interact with matter, uh, uh, there would be nothing to slow them down, but they would keep their, their wave function and their, 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 their um, velocity, but they wouldn't be slowed by ordinary matter. And this is kind of what you see in strange radiation tracks and in the, what I call coherent matter traveling waves in the um, uh, Vega experiments. And you can imagine that if this structure was to land on a metal plate and uh, kind of etch it, you would end up with something similar perhaps to what was observed in the 90s by Matsumoto and by myself when looking at uh, uh, Roy Shinomasa's vibrator plates in 2019. Okay, so now here's the interesting thing here. This is a structure, interaction of a plasmoid with a dielectric surface. Well, what is glass? Maybe that's a dielectric surface. Now, here's the interesting thing here. Look at figure nine here. Separation of a plasmoid part from its body. An object of weak luminescence is visible on the other side of the plate. This is the plasmoid. This is the plate. You see it's changing its shape a little bit, but something is appearing on the other side of the plate. Now, what is this? Could this be this thing here? Could this be the cold neutrino condensate? And this was traveling with it. But when it got to the boundary here, which may or may not be a dielectric surface, the core, it's uh, uh, the body of the plasmoid travels through. And would this explain how uh, these people uh, who we've been discussing in the first part of this uh, presentation, could it be that they were? Uh, let's let's find it. Uh, let's get, give them their names, please. Ah, <laughs> uh, it is James and Kenneth Coram, and when they are referring to passing through glass and the fact that it, it when they looked at it on uh, um, uh, stop frame. Where is it? Where is it? it? Says down here. Da, 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 da. 
Whereas in real time the fireballs seemed to pass through the glass, on stop frame video new fireballs appeared to form on the opposite side of the window. Okay, so it might be in their experiment that um, they had uh, they had uh, where is it? There's me. So you have your sheet of glass and you have your ball of lightning coming along here and just like you see here you have your boundary here. You you had, um, let's say the ball lightning is coming from over here. Am I, have I got that the right, same way for you? No, the ball lightning is coming from here. <laughs> I'm trying to work this out, man. And the body goes through. The body goes through because it's neutral. But I don't know in their experiments if they had a sheet of glass. And uh, what they had was a smoky environment here with charged particles and a smoky environment here with charged particles. And if they did, it might be that the neutral body continues going through because it doesn't get stopped. And the charged body over here gets stopped. And on the other side, the uh, neutrino condensate excites again another uh, uh, cluster of dusty particles on this side. And, and that, it could be as simple as that. Um, and, and you are getting this passing through. So that potentially explains ball lightning being able to pass through uh, a, a, a boundary like glass. Now, what happens to those instances where the ball lightning travels through and either cuts out a section of the glass, leaving a center disc and an outer disc, which I've shared in the past, which one of the Russian observers from a, a ball lightning strike, it went through the glass and rather than uh, it, 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 it cutting the glass out completely, it, it cut out a ring. And this is one of the reasons I came to the conclusion that these coherent matter structures, they have this very active outside. Why would that happen? Well, and, and the other one is it, it can bore right through and just leave a round hole. Why would that happen? Well, I would argue it's because of the type of glass. So remember what I was saying about David Hudson? He had some glass in his lab, the tungsten blew up and the, the glassware on the lab disintegrated. Uh, and my, my experience with, with uh, um, Matthew Vallat and, uh, and Ryan Hunt and so forth, with the Chalani replications, um, having borosilicate glass, it could be that many different types of glasses. Now, what I think is important is one specific type of glass, and this is this is a reveal for you guys, um, uh, and this is testable. Uh, and so, if you have a technology that can produce ball lightning on a regular basis, um, and I think with what I've been describing tonight, you should be able to do that, then. Um, you could have a scenario where you could have a piece of glass and by choosing the type of glass you could have it pass through like I think is happening in this instance or the active, the, the core, this is the body, this is the plasmoid, this is the body okay, of, of the uh, um, structure. One is passing through, um, uh, you can have ones that go through and leave a round hole. And I'm going to pull something up here, so just bear with me, because I think this is this is important to what's going on here. Um, Okay, all right, here we go. Uh, I wanted to say this for so long and uh, um, where you tend to use uh, tough and glass is on high rise buildings. Um, you, you want to have t uh, strengthened glass. And how do you strengthen glass? You, you're gonna kill your, kick yourself when uh, you see what it is. So um, you can go and have a look at it now. It's on Wikipedia. Just type in tempered glass, right? Here we go, tempered glass. And one of the processes for making tempered glass is, da, 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 da. Here we go, here we go. Manufacturing, 
An alternate chemical toughening process involves forcing a surface layer of glass at least 0.1 of a millimeter thick into compression by iron exchange of sodium ions in the glass surface with potassium ions. You're replacing the sodium ions in your normal soda glass, your sodium glass, with potassium ions. Now, what happens? What happens when you have this structure? This, in my view, cold neutrino condensate pass through sodium based glass. Not a lot. It goes through. If there's a dusty plasma on the other side, it can do its business over there and, and become a new ball lining. But if the glass contains potassium, i.e. it's a hardened glass like you have on high rise buildings, then it can pass, as it gets close to the glass, it will then get excited, as exotic vacuum objects do, and interact and cause the 1.551 mega electron volt beta, which is monochromatic from the uh, um, glass to be emitted, either on the boundary layer or the boundary layer is actually a spherical thing. But ball lightning often, uh, and you will see this in our Vega experiments, fireballs like to sit 50% into something, right? 50% into something, yeah? Now, um, if it's stuck 50% in and it's exciting, it will then cut a ring when it gets to a level of coherence. Just as we saw the edge cutting nickel and cutting tungsten in Vega experiments. So you get a ring cut out. It's actually not quite a ring. In the Russian experiments, you have a little nick in one side and that shows the, and it's slightly ovoid sometimes in, in shape. And that shows the, the uh, overall structure of it. It's not a perfect sphere all the time. But if it was to come in and immediately get excited, then the outer sheath would all be impenetrable, right? And it would just, it would, it, traveling in a direction, it would just burn out a round hole. And in fact, I have photos, which I've shared with you in the past, where it's actually bored through concrete and cement in a wall. And why is that? Because some Portland cements contain a percentage, something like 2% in the actual uh, cement uh, of potassium. And so you have a method by which the ball lightning can burrow through concrete or it can leave a round hole in toughened but not untoughened glass. These are testable hypotheses. So you need to create your ball lightning first, but this is a testable hypothesis. You have this data here. You have what these chaps are saying here, okay? And these things align, okay? And you have the fact that ball lightning, sorry, that the toughened glass is uh, iron exchange, is one type of toughened glass. Uh, and you, you basically put, uh, immerse uh, the glass into a bowl, bath of molten potassium nitrate. <laughs> okay? <laughs> oh dear, I love it. Okay, so this is a highly, highly testable hypothesis. And, uh, but by the way, uh, we, we already know that uh, using the same approaches, uh, maybe I can get it from here. Uh, copy link address. Uh, new tab. Paste. So if you're wanting something that turns concrete to dust and makes round holes in windows, this would be it. Um, okay. So I've got this other paper here by Bogdanovich et al. And um, it actually, this, this one here shows a color uh, one here and remember what they were saying about the the plasmoids these structures they start off as a like a red or they can form end up being red and so you can see this red one here in this color image okay i've shared all these things before and you can go and look for bogdanovich on our facebook and and find it so here's your, here's your metal plate here's your water jet with your plasma flow discharge pulse discharge and this is 
uh, a periodic discharge. Um, uh, this is the plasmoid in the air here. Okay. Um, da, da, da. And so they, they actually observed the production of these birdies, which are these magnetic monopoles. Okay. Which are these uh, magnetically charged uh, um, cold neutrino condensates, the synthesized cold neutrino condensates. And they had a synchrotron. They did this in a different way. So these ones were recorded by uh, putting X-ray plates near these kind, this plasma flow discharge. And in this case, they used a synchrotron, fired extremely high energy into uh, a conversion target of beta particles. Uh, this produced a gamma ray. The gamma ray went through a magnet and then the magnet produced north and south monopoles. So you can see the shadow here and then you can see some uh, of these above and some of these below. And they, they say that it's actually extracting them from the surface of the magnet. And these are from older experiments where they are uh, they actually show toroidal and spherical structures. So uh, this is all the same thing. Of course it would be, if you haven't got that by now. <laughs> it's never gonna happen. <laughs> okay. So, so that, that I believe uh, deals with passing through glass and it in actually, in fact, passing through concrete. Um, so we're going to deal with the ball lightning acting as a virtual anode and uh, when we look at the video from David Boulier. Um, uh, so, so Bob Kenter, bulletproof glass contains a high, high percentage of lead last time I looked. Yeah, so uh, bullet, um, bullet uh, proof glass, uh, lead, lead's not really going to stop uh, exotic vacuum objects. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, it, it, boron silica glass does um, and uh, lithiated glass. And, and I think borosilica glass can often contain something like two and a half, three and a half percent of lithium carbonate. Uh, not to say that the carbon is live carbon, um, but there's lots of ways you could mix these, this understanding around to ex ex uh, increase the level of excess heat you would get uh, by leveraging these things. Remember when, remember what, um, uh, what was it? Zatalepin said to Parkamov in a recording that I've shared on MFMP's website from from Sochi 2018. He says, uh, Parkamov, you've got a big radiator of of the the uh, strange radiation, and you're wasting all your strange radiation from your reactor rather than using it. And uh, uh, it's the, the using it that you want to do. Otherwise, almost everything that would produce excess heat is just lost. <laughs> just lost. So anyway. So I, I, I promised that I would um, uh, talk about why oxygen is so good uh, at being the basis for formation of these structures. Now, um, so uh, I, I talked about the, the uh, paper from 2003 of Leonid Oritzkev from the Chernobyl paper, and I've discussed that a number of times in the past. Uh, so you can go and look. Uh, do I have it there? No. You can go and look at the monopole clutch, and I, I discuss it there in that video. And there's a presentation where you can find the link to the paper. Anyway, the interesting thing about uh, various people that have seen ball lightning is where they were located at the time that they observed it. And why is that important? Well, let's take this one for instance. The temperature in Colorado Springs. Okay, let's uh, see here. This is the temperature in Colorado Springs. Now, this is, in my view, a huge reveal. I think this is very important for people replicating uh, um, these kind of effects. Um, you can see that the nighttime temperature, the peak nighttime temperature, or the, the low, lower end of the nighttime temperatures is uh, 14 degrees. Actually, I don't know whether this is daytime temperature, but uh, these are weather averages, so. Maybe there's a colder daytime temperature. But Colorado Springs uh, can be low temperature for, you know, relative to comfortable living for a good proportion of the year, I, I, I would suggest. It has a, a short period 
where it's high and, and certainly in parts of the day it's going to be cold all day uh, and in you know from November through to March uh, you've got periods of the day when it's below zero degrees not that that is that important to what I'm about to tell you but remember I told you about the um, paramagnetic nature of oxygen and there's a presentation I did recently before I went to the UK where uh, I went into how paramagnetic it is over all of the other elements it, anywhere close and you have to go up to things like I think uh, holmium and erbium and things like that before you get to similarly paramagnetic natures uh, elements um, anyway it, it, it's 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 not just that it's paramagnetic uh, but it's it's temperature dependent and let's consider that John Hutchison worked in Canada David Boutlier works in Canada and Bonnet Bogdanovich works in Moscow Russia is that relevant well, I would say that potentially it is very relevant. And also, you've got to bear in mind that if you are working in water, like you are with uh, creating HHO or, or uh, a Mars gas, uh, you are keeping your temperature at the water temperature, generally. And if the water temperature is cold, then, you know, uh, maybe that's got a role to play because of this. The paramagnetic susceptibility of uh, uh, the element oxygen here and I've got a link to this complete uh, booklet of all sort of a very large number of elements and compounds the colder you get it the more magnetic susceptibility you get it's already stupid high when it's oxygen but if you start cooling it it gets a lot higher I mean as a liquid it's much higher so um, I would suggest that if you are in a cold region like uh, Colorado Springs, where Tesla did his ball lightning every day of the week, and working in a place like John Hutchison and David Boutlier and Bogdanovich, you would be more likely to create uh, ball lightning than other parties. And if you're creating it in water, then you've got the temperature of the water, which if you just got it out of the tap or whatever, or you chilled it, this is one way. Um, uh, but you need the oxygen dissolved in the water, I think, to enhance the, the process. Uh, but even the air above the Bogdanovich chamber. So if we, if we go back to uh, his uh, experiment here, uh, we go back to this slide here. Um, he has his chamber below here. The air above might be quite cold, which means the oxygen is more uh, has a higher susceptibility, magnet, paramagnetic susceptibility or magnetic susceptibility, and therefore the opportunity, in my view, for it to form ball lightning is increased. And also, you know, the, the actual clustering may have gone on to a certain degree within the oxygen dissolved in the water or synthesized oxygen. Uh, in the water uh, produced from the exploding foil. So uh, uh, that is a one point I really wanted to give out here. Um, a, a lot of people, and I've even said this in the past, Colorado Springs might have been important because if you look at the rainfall and the, the dryness in the air uh, would have been one thing. This would allow for st higher static buildup. If you have moisture in the air, and in fact, uh, where I live in the Czech Republic, it can sometimes have fantastically low humidity uh, being in land. Uh, sometimes a, a, a level of humidity that's quite hard to achieve scientifically. It's just in the air. And if you chose a location like that, any electricity that you built up, static electricity you build up, would, get, uh, uh, would have a higher uh, chance to build up to a higher level because it doesn't just discharge into the moist air. And so... Um, but I think that's one thing that many people have identified. And I think that's why uh, um, uh, Henry Murray went and did his work out there as well. But I think this other point is, is that these cold neutrino condensates are very good at, uh, uh, in my view, um, binding to oxygen, the lower the oxygen temperature. Now, why is this interesting? Well, someone asked me, how is the ball lightning forming in Hestal and lights? Well, it's relatively simple that firstly um, uh, you're in the northern hemisphere 
Now, um, uh, not, not, not that that's that relevant, but, but you're on a high latitude, i.e. you're in Norway. Why is that important? Well, you've got magnetic flux lines coming in uh, to the Earth. And wh why is that important? Well, because uh, it doesn't matter whether they're north or south, it doesn't matter. Um, because that will attract, in my view, a higher flux of uh, uh, one of the monopoles of these condensed cold neutrinos. And I am not the first person to think of this because representatives of the Fondation de Broglie, and you can go and see on their site, and maybe I'll dig that up for you, they actually recorded strange radiation-like tracks by going up to uh, the, the tundra and using, uh, um, you know, uh, plates and uh, uh, I think it was uh, X-ray film and stuff. So they observed similar type strange radiation tracks from the environment. And you could argue that this might create something like the Aurora Borealis. I mean, everyone talks about it being the, 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 the par particle wind coming from the sun. And yes, of course, it, it, it's a lot to do with that, but it's also to do with the magnetics uh, of the pole and the magnetics of the pole will guide a flux of these uh, structures in exactly the same way as Bogdanovich intuited with the 57 iron, iron 57. They were being pulled in and binding to the nucleus of the ferromagnetic nuclei of iron 57. And so you've got to imagine that the, the flux at the, the pole will be potentially slightly different. And what would this lead to? Well, um, this would lead to maybe spectral lines being slightly shifted when you look at some things in the environment. But it might even mean that you get a different level of condensation there or a different chance of condensation there. And so perhaps this would explain why you get a far higher concentration of ball lightning in this particular valley. The other aspects which I've talked about in the past is temperature changes. Well, if, if it is, firstly, it's a lot lower temperature. So you may have this flux going in, but you've also got lower temperature. Uh, Norway isn't known for being extremely warm uh, 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 all of the year. And so it might be that they have this temperature and they, it might be a particularly relatively dry air area. I don't know. This can be looked into. However, um, it has quartz in the ground and it has copper and so forth. And discharges in the ground, what will that do? Every single discharge will produce an exotic vacuum object. And the condensation process in the exotic vacuum object, I am arguing, and it's not hard to argue when you have uh, Leonid Ritzkev observing strange radiation tracks coming out, observing magnetic monopoles coming out, and observing ball lightning. It's not hard to argue that a certain quantum of, of magnetically charged cold neutrino condensates will be emitting from the freeze thaw or from the, the just the shift in the ground or, uh, and the, uh, the build up of charge in, in that piezo structures. These will discharge, these will go into the environment, combine that with ionization from radon progeny. And you have an environment with the cold air, the cold oxygen, the additional flux of cold neutrino condensates uh, from the cosmos to produce an area which it produces a lot of ball lightning. So uh, I think uh, we've done a lot in those few sentences uh, uh, of brainstorming. And I, and I think we're going to get to an area where um, uh, we're going to look at these videos and it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, the first video I want to show is a Vega experiment. And uh, you should be able to hear the audio. I've got it in here so we don't hear an echo. Um, so uh, this would be very quick. Uh, but this is another experiment by Dave. I asked him to put some quartz crystals into uh, the reactor. So here you see uh, this quartz crystal, or, or it might be, I think it's quartz, but it actually might be some fluorite. But uh, Dave, can you confirm whether that's fl fluorite or? <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so here, I think this is quartz, but it might be fluorite. But anyway, whatever it is, he's got this discharge going on. And I'm going to play it now. Okay, 
you will have seen many, many uh, um, balls of light formed in these various experiments. But there you go. Look at this. It's a, it's a beautiful example of a self-organizing plasma. But the great thing about these Vega experiments with these coiled uh, uh, electrodes, I think this is, uh, I mean, David can say what this is, but this sphere here, you can see the double layer and this is the inside of the double layer where I'm saying the coherent matter, if you've got sufficient energy forming, will we'll get to an intense level of intensity where nothing can resist it. And um, so, yeah, so this is essentially it. And you can see it changing color to a certain degree. But anyway, I, I just I just like this one because you, it's one of these ones where you can clearly see the full sphere uh, and uh, it has an anchor of part of the anode for it to work on. OK. Uh, OK, so this one's coiled titanium foil. So in, in the Vega experiments, we, we've used coiled uh, nickel foil, uh, coiled titanium foil uh, and uh, 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 tungsten wire and so here you've got three different metals uh, just by having the configuration uh, we can produce balls of fire every day of the week but they are bound because they like to be attached to the metals this is what I'm saying and they also like to be 50% attached to the metal so why I like this example is it, it makes the argument for me that I was talking about earlier when I was saying that uh, when we're referring to uh, is it this one? No, it's not that one. Is it this one? No, it's not that one. It's this one. <laughs> when I was making the argument that uh, if you had uh, a ball lightning uh, a neutral state and it goes through and it gets locked into the window frame, it's doing pretty much what you are seeing in this video here um, with, with as a kind of analog when it, when it actually comes here. Uh, it'll come here. Um, and we will play this. Oh, no, we won't, apparently. <laughs> let me get that ready for you. Um, okay, let me get that into position. Okay, so. All right. So, um, so you've got that there. Uh, and it's kind of 50% on the wire. And th this is essentially what we see in many Vega experiments. Uh, You've got the, the wire goes through, and I believe it's going through either the north or the south pole. Uh, um, but anyway, it's 50% through. Uh, when you see it on a solid blob, like you have a piece of metal, you, you get these like hemispherical structures on the top. It's the same thing. Now, um, there's, there's something I talked about in the past where we had the, the lion outside core, this fused quartz, and we had three magnetic spheres uh, produced on the outside. The very interesting thing is that the inside magnetic sphere is 50% inside the quartz and 50% 50% outside the quartz. And I believe what happened was is that the um, uh, the coherent matter structure teleported a large amount of material from the inside the reactor. It came through and it got stuck 50% through the quartz like this, and it got excited at that impedance change. And it produced a sphere on the outside of iron and a sphere on the inside. As it got excited, it just basically consumed the, the material that it was uh, 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 halfway through. And then it kind of travelled on and it produced another sphere. And then it kind of travelled on and produced another sphere. And each of them were highly magnetic because it was transporting so much material within it. Because the nuclei of atom are not very big. <laughs> so it kind of like d did that. And, it, you know, it may have laid down those three spheres instantaneously I mean you would not be able to see it even on a high-speed camera they would just be not there and then they're there <laughs> and one of them is half in the glass and so you know um, and, and, and I, I want to revisit that and in fact um, uh, the lion author has given me permission to uh, take this lion 4 reactor which has two active cores in it apart so I'm gonna do a live video where I break this up and uh, we look at it on the microscope and on the macro lens and stuff. So we can potentially see more of these things going on. Okay, so um, th this, is, this is nice from a Vega experiment point of view. Now I'm going to show you uh, this video from uh, David Boutier's, um, uh, his uh, 
ball lightning production attempt and I think you're going to like it a lot. And we're going to step through it. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Give me a second. Okay. All right. Hopefully the sound's not too loud for you. Okay, so let's move that over there so you can see it. Okay. Did you see it? 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 <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is we're going to step through this uh, bit by bit and uh, 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 maybe I will put it into Premiere so we can zoom in. So I think I, if you just bear with me, I'm going to uh, attempt to destroy my machine by <laughs> having it running too many things. When I run Premiere, it'll probably go, <coughs> die on me. Okay, so it just will be the best way to do this because I can zoom into part of the frame and we can look at the behavior of stuff. So just let me, bear with me, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I, I don't think these are sprites. I think these are balls of fire, free floating balls of fire. Um, uh, like I said, on the top of his ball, and he can describe himself if he's still here, um, he, he had uh, aluminium foil uh, with, some, uh, with some carbon on there, T potentially charcoal. Was it, David, was it charcoal or was it, uh, uh, was it uh, carbon? Just, just graphite. some point. No, Premiere's still loading. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> I'm going to kill some other applications here, maybe. That will give me some more joy. Fantastic, David. I think that's why you had uh, more success but uh, it, it, so David has just confirmed that it was charcoal. This means, in my view, it is live carbon and it would be working in the same basis as these other authors had done where you, you get a heating up, it vaporizes a bit, produces a point where it would discharge and uh, so on. But they're suggesting having a point and, uh, uh, and then having the vapors in the air. And, and I've discussed uh, with David how um, it would be best to use, in my view, a beeswax candle and have them all, burn, lots of them, and then burning and then you just hit it with a fan, blow them all out and hit, hit the charge. And I think you'll probably see a lot. Still trying to load Premiere. <laughs> oh dear, so boring. Just because it's overheating. Okay, we're making progress slowly, slowly. So the questions I want to address in this bit, so we, we've done 
glass passing through and not passing through and included uh, uh, um, going through concrete. We've talked about Hestalen and how that can form. I've brought in Bogdanovich. And we want to talk about subsequent uh, streamers. Subsequent streamers are, are attracted to balls. And so therefore, um, is, is ball lightning acting as a virtual anode? And I think that is absolutely a critical thing to consider. So is that working? Okay, so we, we have we have a premier up here. So give me a second. I'm sure you'll work it out, David. Okay. Now the previous video I did uh, was upscaled because the, the original video was very low resolution. But I'm actually going to work with, as we step through this, with the original video uh, so that there's no uh, um, potential uh, uh, transcoding artifacts uh, that might confuse the data that's in the, the original video. So sometimes it's just better to work with the uh, whatever the original quality is you have uh, to ensure that uh, you're getting the best uh, interpretation of your data. So let me see if that works. Getting there, getting there. Okay, right. <laughs> Maybe I can pull that up here. Yes, okay. All right. So I'm going to just quickly look through this and find the point in the video where we're going to want to start this. I'm going to put tip Premiere on so you can hear the audio from that. Okay. Right, and we'll zoom in here. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm not engaging with you so much at this night because I just want to get through um, the content. Um, so let me just see. Okay, we're seeing everything we want to see. Okay, maybe. Right, let's see if this works. Okay. It would be helpful if I could. Can I? Can, I... can you give me 300? Can you give me 300? Okay, alright. So going to give me 400 or 200 anyway that's what we're going to have to work with okay so all right let's step through this Okay, oh, okay, we saw the first one there. Stop! Stop! <laughs> okay, the machine's frozen. Okay, now it's listening to me. Okay, we, we did see the first one there. Oh, come on, now, now it's catching up with all my keystrokes. Oh dear. Oh, are we really living in 2021? Okay. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill a different app. Because I can't, I've got no choice but to kill it. Right, because it just uses too much memory. Okay, right, let's try again. Okay, so can we we'll step through this? Okay. Okay, so okay, one one appeared. It kind of almost comes from behind here, 
and it's ejected at quite some velocity. It comes down, it basically freezes in, in space. It comes down much, much slower. And then kind of almost it's coming back up again. And then it, it accelerates behind and the, or, or in front and does something on the uh, secondary coil down the bottom there. Okay, we'll step through again, see when the next one comes. Oh, okay. Oh, this is really nice. Okay. So this is interesting because look at this streamer here. Okay. If I step forward, there's something coming off right on the point of contact on the bottom here. But there's another one that seems to come out of this kink. And this is very much like the uh, previous authors were describing. There's there's the one on the core here. This is like our, our tuft, our, our ball of fire uh, initiation point there. But we've got another one a, a, a distance up. And it, it comes out, and so we have two. We have one here, and we have one here. Okay. And as we step forward, this isn't actually one; it's two, and they split up. And you see this kind of thing with Hestal and ball lights. But the interesting thing is, you see it split up. There's almost something going on between them. There's like something connecting them. Okay. And they go apart to a certain distance. And the one at the bottom here, it goes out, out, and then it comes back in. And it, it kind of discharges or connects to the, the, the head of the Tesla ball, okay? And it's almost like it, it, it plays a role in initiating this discharge, okay? In fact, as you look at it, it, it almost always remains slightly connected, but not really, to its mothership, the, the Tesla ball. These two seem like they're bound to a certain degree, they split at that point. Ah, in front, if you go forward, okay, so what, what you need to look at what I've got down here, and in fact, I, I can, it's got the head position there, but maybe I can change that to frames. So I'm gonna change it to frames. So you can see five or five. So you can see when I'm going forward or back, maybe it's too small, but anyway. Um, so yeah, th these two look bound, they come apart, and then they, they take their own paths on. This one almost becomes part of this streamer, and this one almost come, becomes part of this streamer. In fact, they do. The streamers then, they, they've got their own mind. The streamer is coming up here. It, it, it looks like it's bending towards this one, and this one looks like it's bending towards that one. And in fact, this one actually does merge with it, and another one comes out here. So it does appear that what they are, in fact, <laughs> Okay, so th this streamer went through this one and then it moved off to the side and the ball lightning is still stuck there. And then another streamer goes through it and then it's still going through it and it's actually pushing it around. It's still here, still underneath and it's joined up again with this streamer and now it's still there in this streamer and now maybe it's gone down here, I don't know. So let's st step back through that sequence. This is definitely looks like it is attracting the subsequent streamers and acting like a virtual anode. And it, it might be that when they come out, they, they they don't have much positive charge. They're mostly negative charge, maybe. And, and, and then they lose some of their negative charge, potentially, as it's cohering. And then you just have the positive uh, stuff in there. Whatever. It does appear to be attracting these together. So we'll, we'll go through. I'll, I'll count from the beginning. So... Initiation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I think it's pretty much gone by that point. It might be this point here. Oh, no, 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 it hasn't gone. It's here. And it comes out, it, it gets really excited and it jumps out and it jumps over to here and it, it parks itself down here. And it's still here, and it's over here, and it's... Ah, oh, okay. It's really special. It jumps, and you know what this reminds me of? You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of... I don't know if you remember, but there was that uh, coherent matter that appeared to come out of... Uh, I think it was actually another Vega experiment. And it came out of it. It came out, jumped, went over, jumped again, got re-excited as it kept hitting the cathode, jumped again... 
and then came round and went round the 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 field or, or the spiral of, of the actual discharge area. So th this actually looks quite similar to that in many respects. Um, so so yeah. So forward, 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 forward. So this is the one that keeps persists for a long period of time. It's there. It's there. Gets re-excited, jumps out, jumps all the way over here, hits here, kind of stops for a bit, jumps again, comes over here, stops and disappears. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well done, David. Oh, oh, okay, we got another one there. This one kind of just fell down. I think we're gonna have to zoom out for this. Maybe, let's, let's go down. So, comes out here, right, so it, it, it almost, I don't know where it's appearing from. It just, it, the moment it's just dropping, it's dropping. And then it slows down, it slows down. And now it's starting to curve off to one side and you're looking at me, so you can't even see it. What an idiot. <laughs> How long's that been going on for? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'm gonna step back. Uh, to the previous one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. At least the camera hasn't died today. I fixed that bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that was that was I think the first one that Dan Moretti saw. So we'll have a look at that one again. Okay. So that was the first one. So we go back to that one. So that ejects out fast speed. I'm talking about this one here. Kind of slows down, sort of drifts up, drifts up, and then boom, it goes and connects itself to the secondary coil. So we'll go to the next ones. Okay, that's just there, a little bit back from there. actually a smaller one there okay so there was one between that but it's not so interesting so you have the three coming out comes out two over here they're kind of bound but we're following this one following this one still there you see the streamer came to it and went away the next streamer goes right the way through it there again and now it's below it okay it's still there it's still there it goes over to here and then it kind of it, another one streamer kind of goes through it and it comes off to here, jumps over to here, hits the ball, bounces, kind of gets stuck, jumps again, bounces, gets stuck, and then it disappears. Okay, so that's the one I'm talking about. There's another one there, it was very quick. Another one very quick. Okay, so this is the one we're talking about now where you completely lost it, or I, I didn't share it with him. So it, it almost appears actually that it is born in this one, okay? But it's in a neutral state, but it, it sometimes, it somehow gets excited a little bit afterwards and it starts to drop down, drops down, drops down. Unfortunately, the, the camera's a slight angle, so, but you, you can imagine it's kind of dropping down. It, it largely looks like it's going under its own gravity here, but, it then just starts to curve away and it d diverges from gravity significantly down here. It's still going down, so I'm going to go down a little bit further so you can see it down here. If it's not frozen on me, it's frozen on me. Okay, okay. so it's down here. Uh -huh. And it comes off and it's definitely not going gravity here and then it just disappears. It, it, again, it sort of... It looks like it contacts the the uh, coil below. Okay, have we missed anything up here? No, we'll go forward. Oh, okay, we had another one there. Okay, so this one is really classic to what they were describing. So you have a nodule that's formed here, this kink. There's a kink here with a nodule here. Watch that nodule, watch this nodule. It's like a right-hand turn here. 
And there, there, look at that. Look at it, it's broken off. It's broken off. It's falling down and it sort of comes out at a different angle. It's like freezing in free, free air there. Oh, and there's a lower streamer that's coming to it. This is showing its virtual anode nature and it's dead, it's gone, right? Go back. So it's forming in this nodule, forming in this nodule, forming in this nodule. And ready, ready, boom, it's there, it's falling, it's falling, 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 falling. Comes out at an angle, kind of doesn't like to get too close to this coil. And a streamer comes down and attacks it. And then it's gone. Okay, we're going forward. Okay, we've got another one coming out here. Okay, this again seems to form off uh, the structure on the surface here. It, it, it's ejected. It might actually be slightly, slightly out. No, it looks like it's on, on the surface. Jex comes out here. Comes. Oh, it's gone round in a circle. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's coming back in. It's eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There, there, there. Oh, it's. Oh, no, no. It, <laughs> it's now done a, a quick change of direction and it's disappeared. So I'll just play that real time. Hey, did a nice little S, didn't it? Look at that. Nice little S. Ready? Hey! <laughs> Love it. Any more for any more? What you got in store? Oh, oh, look at that one. That's lovely. Okay, here we go. Dum, dum, dum. Oh, okay, so. Okay, so there's a nodule on this as well. So here he's got a straight line. A nodule appears to form here, okay? Nodule forming there, and then it gets ejected, and it's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. So I've said to David we need higher spatial resolution and higher time resolution. Uh, perhaps he has it in higher resolution somewhere. It's coming down here, it's coming down here, it's like, oh, now it's going back up, it's going back up, it's going back up, and it's disappeared. It goes, blinks out there. <laughs> it just gives up. Oh, oh no. I'll play that in real time again. I'll wind it back, backwards. This is going backwards. Look at the frames over here, I'm going backwards. So the initiation is this streamer here. It forms a, a kink, a nodule, and that breaks up and it ejects it. So we'll go back to the beginning and I'll play it real time. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Well done, David, well done. Oh, we got another one there. That's a more of a wiggly one. Okay. There we go. Oy. <laughs> any more for any more? Okay, there we go. So I'll play the whole lot uh, together now. I think everything is, I'll just, you don't need to see the sparks above. We'll just keep it here. Then we can see all of the action in one go. So this is just the real time. Count them, count them. Ready? One. Two, three, four, five. <laughs> Six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> well done, David. Well done, David. Well done, you. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, I think that David has achieved replication of Tesla's um, fireball generation, which makes him one of a few select people on planet Earth that have done this. I think that uh, um, uh, the fireball uh, production um, described by uh, James and Kenneth Corum by working from the uh, notes 
from Colorado Springs, which are the same notes that John Hutchison worked from, uh, are a good basis for developing this. I think um, uh, when we take into consideration uh, live and active things like potassium hydroxide, for instance, um, uh, potassium, um, uh, carbon uh, from charcoal or from beeswax smoke, uh, and we take into consideration lower temperatures and drier environments. So you want dry environment, active beta emitters, uh, low temperature oxygen uh, as, as much as you can get, uh, and high voltage and extremely short duration uh, uh, discharges. The shorter amount of time and the higher intensity of joules uh, that you can achieve uh, the discharge in, then the better it is. And if you want to do a much, much simpler experiment, a capacitor bank with metal uh, uh, exploding wires in water gives you, and I would suggest highly oxygenated water. So I would boil it for a period of time, get rid of the dissolved nitrogen, get rid of the whatever's in there, and then bubble oxygen through it and saturate it with oxygen. Then cool it down, uh, so that it's just above zero uh, and then I would do the discharge in there and I think you might get to see both the strange radiation oh, sorry, the strange radiation tracks uh, caused by these magnetic monopole condensates coming out and you might see the ball lightning structures and I think it's fairly well described the Aritzkiet paper um, <clears throat> and then once you understand that if you have some Tesla coils uh, uh, you, I think I would like to see an experiment where you have uh, a piece of glass uh, with with carbony dust on one side and carbony dust on the other, and, and see the transfer through with higher frame rate uh, cameras, uh, and we have access to those now, so that's fantastic. And so we could get a really beautiful uh, capture of that, and ideally something which uh, um, takes on board what Bogdanovich is showing uh, in this uh, study. And then maybe uh, if you're very lucky and you've got high enough power ball lightning, I just I just don't think um, we're going to be able to realistically achieve uh, ball lightning that's able to cut through glass. But if someone does it, that would be absolutely amazing. And I would suggest getting uh, uh, chemically toughened glass, the type that you might expect to see on high rise buildings and see if we can either get the round coherent matter sheath cut layer or one where it's actually bored a hole through. We know that we can bore holes through in, in the case of uh, alumina and stuff like that because I saw that in Parkamov's um, uh, fuel mixture in Moscow in 2015 where the, the, something had bored little holes through. And we know that we've seen it, as I said earlier, in, in the lion reactors and, and we have another one that we will look at there in the coming days. But um, yeah, so uh, in summary, uh, we have uh, walked through a lot of what's necessary to understand this technology um, and uh, these things are all related and uh, they're intrinsically linked and one will yield the other whether you like it or not. And I'm going to talk in the next video, which may be tomorrow, the, the day after, on Friday. Um, uh, Bin Juen Hang, uh, Huang from uh, uh, Taiwan University, uh, he sent me some data and uh, it matches predictions, uh, which is quite exciting. But he was using copper in an ultra uh, um, type experiment, uh, like aluminium. And I said in the beginning of 2017 in my uh, presentation at IIT Mumbai that if you want to create this effect, you need uh, a low melting point, high uh, uh, conductivity metal. And uh, the, the ones that I've talked about here are aluminium and copper, but I believe that silver would be extremely, extremely good. So I, I'm going to put a challenge out there. Who wants to go and buy some silver foil and run a... Um, a uh, ultra experiment and I would also consider as I said in the previous presentation adding uh, uh, potassium nitrate and I would add also to that uh, boiling the water first 
and highly oxygenating it and keeping its temperature low. And the combination of these effects, I think, might yield to uh, higher levels of transmutation. There is no uh, uh, way that you are going to have high intensity, uh, short duration, uh, high dual discharges into molten silver and not see the production of coherent matter condensates and you will definitely have uh, uh, ectonic explosions, these columbic explosions, and these will produce strange radiation. There's just literally no way you're not going to have it happen. And uh, so um, uh, there are technologies that, that uh, uh, like to, to not even consider that this is happening, uh, but that it will be happening whether they like it or not. Unfortunately, they live in the same universe as the rest of us, and uh, with the best will in the world, and it's just not going to change. This isn't the case of their truth and another truth. This is the truth, and this is what will happen every time, and uh, um, and every system you look at. So it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the carbonyl nickel of um, uh, of uh, the two two five day reactor, <clears throat> the ectonic explosions on there producing coherent matter, and then and allowing the reactor to. to uh, uh, produce excess energy for the best part of seven months and uh, I believe some of that was coming from this this material this this coherent matter uh, causing cluster uh, uh, decay of of the tungsten heater wire um, and so forth so um, you know uh, it's 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 been an interesting journey um, and we've got a lot more to say so I'm going to look at your notes now uh, uh, and see if you've got any questions, and uh, then I will call it a night. Uh, so where are we? Okay. Okay. So the fantastic, fantastic. Uh, uh, participation by David. Thank you very much for uh, people. Uh, actually, that's a good idea. Um, loading the water with nanobubbles of oxyhydrogen, uh, which is not a simple thing in its own right, would probably be a very good approach uh, to increasing um, the production of strange radiation. We've seen strange radiation tracks from just straight vibrating plates from um, Amasa, uh, and we've seen the cluster uh, marks as well, and the counter rotating vortices and transmutation and stuff. So. So uh, David is giving an overview of the vapor experiment uh, electronics, uh, which produced this kind of effect, uh, which we looked at a little bit earlier. But uh, if you go to the MFMP YouTube channel, you can see lots of videos uh, produced by uh, Dave and um, also for Hank. And this is one such video produced by Dave, which includes the uh, self-organized plasma structure. Where is it? Somewhere around here. There you go. Lovely. <laughs> Um, uh, David was uh, uh, sent me this uh, early last year or when we were starting to um, work together on Vega and um, uh, he was quite embarrassed about the quality and the fact that the, the, the camera's on the, an angle and the fact that it, it wasn't a very good uh, setup. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, what, what it demonstrates is that there were the production of the ball lightning. They were 
being birthed on the surface or on the nodules along the streamers and that they acted as virtual anodes and that is really really important information and if they get extra discharges they live longer and if they don't this is exactly what Ken Shoulders said about exotic vacuum objects they liked electrons and if they don't get them they will fade and die away at least in the visible sense Yeah, Jason Cook, think of an exotic vacuum object as miniature ball lightning, yeah. But in, in actual foul, actuality, <laughs> a ball, big ball lightning is an exotic vacuum object as well. Okay, does ball lightning work like the Sapphire Electric Sun model? Um, uh, ball lightning will... Um, the double layer is something that's been known for a very long time in plasma physics. Uh, the self-organizing balls of fire uh, were discussed in a... Uh, a they've been known for a very long time as well, uh, but uh, there was a good discussion of them, which I've shared in a previous presentation, I think from 2001 or 2002, in the Plasma Physics Journal, in the J Japanese J uh, one. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, it's obviously got electric in there, uh, and I believe that the sun is acting as, as a virtual anode, uh, and it's because uh, as, you, as you produce more neutrons, you, you get more positive, and so you suck in... Um, you suck in electrons from the cosmos and uh, moreover you have a gravitational body so you'll also suck in relic neutrinos and so that could play a role in the process. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you can imagine that if you can punch holes through concrete and uh, w you can turn metal to dust and, and turn metal to jelly, um, if this technology, which is probably uh, been discovered in the past, uh, it would certainly uh, be able to play roles in, in uh, adventures in the past history. Uh, yes, uh, it is the Pandora's box, I'm afraid it's just what it is. Um, okay. and, and in part I'm leaving the stream open for a little while so that people can discuss what they want at the bottom. I didn't get to talk about it today, but there is this other paper um, that looks at spectrum. So I might just add that to the bottom of the previous presentation blog on remoteview.icu.
Yeah, um, David's right. Uh, the uh, the Vega plasmoids seem to do what they want to do. Uh, the only thing they seem to interact with uh, definitely are other uh, plasmoids uh, or uh, coherent matter traveling waves. They uh, uh, they seem to interact with those as we've seen and described. Okay, so just to confirm that David Boutlier, for those that didn't know, he says very dry where I did the experiments on ball lightning. So um, I think this is something that we can pretty much take to the bank. Uh, dry air, uh, cold air, preferably, uh, and uh, high discharge, rate of discharge, and uh, particles uh, in the air to promote the production of them and I think that's uh, you know the long and the short of it but uh, I think what Eritzkev has shown is that you can create um, all of the same observations uh, but with just exploding foil exploding wire uh, and titanium is a great one to use because it's a relatively light element and if you look at the <coughs> um, uh, Mashinsky work uh, titanium has t 22 electrons and so uh, that because of the shell structure uh, it's almost a perfect amount uh, for the intensity of uh, what he calls spin nucleide electron condensates um, and so titanium I would say is a first choice uh, for exploding foils uh, because of its the, the actual structure of the atom and its electron shells. And so I, I would suggest doing titanium foils just as he did. Um. Bob Green, Bob Jean, is uh, underground water location relevant where when lightning strikes um so uh water the the oxygen in the water can capture these cold neutrino condensates also metals may be dissolved in the water and somehow um may be able to capture them um metals in the ground will attract them uh if you look at parkamov's book from the in the fourth chapter he talks about uh, dowsing, for which you do for water and metals, and uh, he talks about how uh, these cold neutrino condensates, whilst they can be reflected by solid matter, they do penetrate the ground, and so uh, these are the ones from the cosmos, and so the concept is is that your spine is an antenna for these cold neutrino condensates. So when you're standing upright, the 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 um, the cold neutrino condensates come from the cosmos. They go into the ground, uh, interact with the metal uh, or water stream under the ground, and you get a different sense in your body um, because of that interaction. And uh, so the dowsing rods will will cross or whatever. And you know this is being my my father was a dowser. He tried to teach me. And uh, I, I was, uh, I, I don't know, I was interested, but I, I wasn't as good as him. He was very good at it. He would look at it. When he was digging the ground, he would look for where, where to avoid cables or he would look, because he was a farmer, he would look for where the water is. And, and in fact, dowsers are in high demand in California with the drought there at the moment. Uh, I discussed this in my last presentation. So um, uh, if uh, water and uh, metal can um, influence the cold neutrino condensate flux from the cosmos, then I would imagine that um, uh, the lightning would be attracted to those very same things. Because, <laughs> you know, you, you can see that these uh, condensates uh, in the ball lightning that you saw in the video from, from David Butlier, uh, that attracts the streamers from from the Tesla coil and I imagine it w would be the same thing I mean uh, 
I, I think in a relatively short period of time, if people care and they're, they're, they're listening and they're critically thinking and uh, they do their own research, I think these things are just going to be, they're just going to be like another thing, another normal science that people uh, accept and they, they don't know why people didn't realise it before. <laughs> the reality is many people did realise it before, but, uh, you know, there we go. So Bob Kent, uh, Evo's still a, a bit out of my grasp. I think I think you should go and read the papers from um, uh, Ken Shoulders and go and uh, look at his book. You can get access to most of them, I think, from uh, our Facebook page. Oh, there's some interesting comments in the thread, so it makes it interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, is there anything down at the bottom of any interest? Um, right. Okay, I think uh, I'll just uh, summarise. So basically what we've discussed today is um, the making of uh, uh, ball lightning uh, and its uh, relation to uh, technological ball lightning versus natural formation. And uh, we started with this image here of the uh, Bootlier uh, video. So uh, I'll go there now <laughs> and uh, you can see if, you, if here, this is this ball lightning here, and if we step forward, uh, this is the previous presentation, and out of this previous presentation, I was reminded of uh, John's work again, and he talked about uh, there's something moving on the surface very fast, and this is a, it, 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 the same as reported by Bogdanovich in his structures that he recorded and shared in 2019. And he uh, blasted a high energy discharge and he has uh, 500 joules of 25,000 watts low inductors or um, uh, he could dump 150,000 volts DC powered uh, uh, from this particular transformer uh, into some aluminium or copper. I would suggest that you might even get a better result even from silver, but obviously it's more expensive than these two. Aluminium has this advantage that it is uh, a single isotope. And so if it's going to cohere, it would be able to do that as well. But then we know that uh, titanium works and titanium has a lot of isotopes. So this may not be so important. Um, if you just want to create it, it might just be the dryness of the air, the amount of oxygen in the air and so forth. Um, here we have uh, the work of uh, Aroitzkev and in Aroitzkev's work he created via an exploding foil a ball, ball lightning on a like every time basis, uh, pretty much a many time basis. Uh, he created magnetic monopoles and proved that they were as such and he observed strange radiation tracks. So all of these things are intrinsically linked. And uh, this is the description uh, in this paper of the proof of the magnetic charges. Um, you can create these technologically by having the energy of particles over uh, 0.5 EV. And if you are, for instance, at the temperature of say 2000 uh, 600 or something, the same temperature as a 100 watt light bulb, tungsten filament light bulb, you can have about 30% of those tungsten filament 
uh, light bulb, tungsten filament atoms uh, producing cold neutrinos. And so that's interesting. I talked about the fuel in the air, and I, I said uh, in yesterday's presentation, uh, day before yesterday's presentation, or Sunday's presentation, um, that nitrogen was an important fuel. But I said oxygen, in my view, plays a role in clustering, and that is because of its paramagnetic nature. And its paramagnetic nature is relative to the temperature of the air. And in Colorado Springs, where Tesla and Murray did their work. Um, it's got a very low temperature. It's also, in my understanding, a dry air, and that is also important. But many people, are, and I, including myself, have discussed the dry air aspect a bit before. But now I'm saying that the cold air aspect is important. Obviously, water typically coming out of your ground source or, 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 or uh, something that's underground will be cold. And so um, this might be why... Uh, reactors tend to produce less exciting stuff as they move on, as they get hotter, they stop stop doing some interesting stuff and people that are doing experiments might like to think about that. And uh, I then said that John Hutchison worked in Canada, David Boutlier was working in Canada and he's confirmed that it was dry air as well and Bogdanovich is working in Moscow and I can tell you that place gets really cold. Um, and uh, here's the data uh, from this link which you can go and have a look at and download the paper. That's right, the, the, the uh, data, and it's about the magnetic susceptibility of oxygen at various temperatures from uh, gas to liquid to solid. And you can see that it uh, rapidly uh, changes uh, as you get colder. Um, and, uh, and then I've just got this from the previous presentation uh, showing the oxygen here and silicon and, and aluminium and uh, so forth uh, from the previous presentation and this video here and then I will close out by showing the so this is a um, titanium and we've done it with nickel and we've done it with um, tungsten as well and I'll close out by showing the other video in its all its glory um, it, which is currently in premiere if I can get, get it to come up uh-huh and here it is, in theory. So there's that, so a big round of applause for David Boutlier's uh, work on that and for his uh, uh, agreement to share that data with the wider community today. So thank you very, very much. Um, then the other thing we discussed is uh, this work of um, uh, Bogdanovich et al at the Moscow Nuclear uh, Physics uh, University, Research University Institute in Moscow and the fact that it produces these balls and toroids uh, and that some of the toroids persist on metal for up to three days at least, you know, two days rather in their experiments and that they recorded these clusters that span both on, uh, on their own axis and on the collective axis and that these uh, um, uh, are subcomponents and that you can imagine if this blows up it would create things that fly off in weird uh, uh, trajectories and if they uh, don't interact with normal matter uh, other than to uh, leave a scar behind uh, that there doesn't appear to be any slowing down you would end up with tracks that match the strange radiation tracks and that the as they say here separation of the plasmoid part from its body this is the uh, body this is the plasmoid part so as it's coming through uh, it leaves the plasmoid behind and the, and the body travels through so this implies that this is neutral and the work that we discussed uh, by these uh, people that tried to replicate and succeed to successfully replicate uh, uh, the work of uh, Tesla and his Colorado Spring Notes and James and Kenneth Coram that they um, were able to observe on camera 
that the um, ball lightning seemed to go through glass, uh, uh, but it didn't really. It kind of like stopped and then it kind of faded there and then it grew, grew again on the other side. And that, that I believe is explained by this. And then I said that the reason you get uh, uh, some uh, uh, glasses it goes through and other glasses it leaves either a cut out uh, area with, with a disc that doesn't quite fill the whole space that's left, like I've shown you in previous Rus uh, Russian uh, presentations, um, or it just removes a round hole like we saw a hemisphere taken out of the outside of um, the line reactor is because it gets excited and I believe the, the reason it gets excited is uh, uh, at the boundary or as it goes through uh, is because it gets excited because uh, or may get excited because of hardened glass containing potassium or uh, for instance lithium carbonate or, or borosilicate so it depends very much on the type of glass uh, and the conditions at which that it, it's passing through that glass in through that dielectric uh, um, uh, change in impedance and so um, uh, this can also explain uh, why it's going through uh, concrete and so when you see a ball lightning has made a hole all the way through some concrete and where, where's the material gone that the concrete's gone it's basically maybe taken part in in fueling the ball lightning and converted into light and leptons as the nucleons are decayed um, or uh, uh, it's condensed into heavier elements like iron and uh, the potassium provides an ongoing fuel. So if you, for instance, you had a, a large uh, um, volume of concrete that you wanted to turn to dust and to, I don't know, little microspheres of, uh, of, you know, iron, uh, magnetic iron, like magnetite, um, uh, mag mag uh, iron and oxygen, uh, ball lightning could do that. And uh, um, so that's something to bear in mind. And, uh, you know, typically high rise buildings will have toughened glass on them. And so, you know, they would be at more risk um, of experiencing a hole in their window. And this could be tested by doing something like what David Bootley has done with the learning about the dryness of the environment, that the, the way that which the power is delivered and the lowness of the temperature um, could be uh, conducting some tests with different glasses and see uh, if any of these ball lightning are able to punch a hole through them. And uh, so so that's probably about that. And the fact that um, uh, we, I believe that we demonstrated that the ball lightning, uh, as these other people are saying, acts as a virtual anode. And uh, that it has very, very important implications for producing a technological energy generator and uh, we're going to be coming on to that but I, I believe that in this video you've seen that a ball lightning can be made to sustain for a period of time and that as long as it gets fed electrons as is said by Ken Shoulders it will persist if you can control its position then uh, you, you can feed it and you can stop it from uh, interacting and, and dissipating or, or destroying other material and uh, those combination of things uh, we know that it is emitting uh, some type of uh, light which we can use uh, it's likely emitting strange radiation and that can lead to the production of power and we are on our way to producing a uh, energy generator that produces light and electricity and with that i will say thank you very much for your time uh, thank you very much again to david butelio and uh, uh, everyone else that's joined us, James, Jason, Elias, uh, Shockwave, uh, Captain Laz, uh, Steve. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I don't know, don't know how many of you are bots. Uh, there's been some interesting conversations in the chat tonight. Um, but uh, uh, thank you, Mighty Mouse girlfriend. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, so the next next one will be about um, the work of Bin Jun Hang Huang at uh, uh, Taiwan University. And then I might take a pause because I've got to prepare for my presentations that I will be giving at the Condensed Matter Nuclear Science uh, Conference in Italy at the end of the month. And uh, 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 that's going to take quite a lot of work. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. And I will see you hopefully on Friday. Bye bye for now.